And now I'd like to introduce the presenters for today. Uh, today we have uh, Marlene Van Balagui. She's the metadata librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries. She received her degree from the Faculty of Information Studies, University of Toronto. At the University of Toronto Libraries, Marlene is responsible for providing access to electronic resources, the maintenance of ILS metadata, and automated metadata generation. Our other presenter is Julia Bory. She's a cataloging librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries, where she is responsible for cataloging serials and monographic materials in a variety of languages and formats. Prior to joining the University of Toronto Libraries, Julia worked as a bilingual reference librarian at York University, and she earned her degree from the University of Toronto. And with that, I will turn things over to Marlene and Julia. Hello, everyone. We apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with our presentation, which was inspired by a real life example of user and research librarians searching for an Einstein paper. We received the following notes from a reference librarian, and, and we feel that it exemplifies some of the common problems in serials and article discoverability that we'll cover in this presentation. So the note read, we recently spent considerable time trying to locate the English translation of an Einstein paper. After much soothing it came to uh, light that another library at, UF, at University of Toronto had it. This is definitely not clear in the shared catalog record. Perhaps something could be done to aid future seekers. So while investigating this problem, we found that the underlying relationships between the article and the journal and the monograph where the paper was republished were not apparent. And even though we had several, uh, several copies of the paper in our collection in different manifestations, they were not easily identifiable and not linked in a way that would have facilitated discovery and access to our user. So to see what kind of relationships would have helped, we mapped the uh, Einstein paper in Ferber. So you can see that Einstein wrote an important paper, paper on thermodynamics uh, in German, which was published um, in a journal with the journal language text and was published in Annalen der Physik uh, in 1903, issue 11. And we have a copy in our Gersten Library periodical collection. So that's our science library, and that's the biggest science library in Canada. The electronic version, another manifestation of the article, is available through our subscription to Wiley Online, and also through open access through European Cultural Heritage Online collection. There is the article was then republished by Princeton University Press in 1989 as a monographic volume as part of the collected papers. It was republished in the original language of publication. In our case, the article is in German and was available in our monographs collection. Princeton then republished the German language, uh, the English language, I'm sorry, um, collection the same year, and we have uh, that copy in a different library. Um, there are 44 libraries at, at UFT, so as you see, we have different uh, resources in, in different li libraries. The uh, information that the user was seeking was not available in the form of an article that was contained in an issue of an article, but it was rather a chapter contained in a book from a, from a monographic collection. And within our catalog, the description of resources is at the monograph or serial level, but this did not help. Sorry, I'm trying to adjust the audio again. Is this better? Uh, it sounds better to me, yes. Great. So within our catalog, the description is at the monograph or serial level, but this did not help our patron as they were looking for a resource at a different level of granularity. They needed the chapter within the book. So an additional search tools that we have, such as science, indexing and abstracting databases, Salmon, Google, also did not work to meet the specific research needs. 
So this experience of searching for the elusive translation made, made, made us analyze this problem. And I will, will pass it to Marlene, who will talk about what is it that makes serial titles so difficult to find using our current search tools. Hello, is this audio OK? Yes. Yes, OK. OK. So in our analysis of this problem, it became clear that a common source of confusion among patrons is that there are two levels of metadata to navigate. There's the metadata related to the serial publication, which is contained in the library catalog. And then there's the article level metadata, which is contained in indexing and abstracting databases. As our discovery systems have evolved, searching for serials has been improved somewhat. We now have new web scale discovery systems, such as Summon, that serve as a single point of access for all library resources. But as Julia has illustrated with the Einstein example, these systems don't serve every research need because the data lying underneath the system does not adequately describe the relationships between the resources. Another problem for access stems from the fact that serial publications frequently undergo title changes. And with each title change, a new bibliographic record is created. Now for users, following the history of a periodical title through time in our current systems is like putting together a puzzle. And all our users don't have the time or the patience for puzzles, they just want the resource. The discovery process can also be complicated by the fact that serials are often issued in multiple versions. It's now the norm for serials to be issued in print and electronic formats. And for some serials, microform is still being produced for preservation and research purposes. This problem of multiple versions has led to the proliferation of nearly identical records being created within our systems. And having too many records for the same title can lead to the possibility that the user may miss the one record that would best suit their research need. A final barrier to access that I'd like to mention is the fact that cataloging co uh, codes have changed over time, leading to many inconsistencies within our catalogs. A major example is the change in cataloging practice regarding title main entry. In the 1970s, the library community shifted from latest entry cataloging to successive entry cataloging, and many libraries still have both types of records within um, their library catalogs. And these inconsistencies can um, only make the discovery process more complicated for users. Some of the challenges that users face in finding serial resources stem directly from the MARC format itself. Perhaps one of the greatest limitations of MARC is that is the fact that it doesn't work well on the web. MARC was designed in the, in the 60s for the creation and dissemination of cataloging between libraries. It wasn't invented to drive computerized information retrieval systems. And although there are, are a limited amount of machine-friendly data in the form of fixed fields, most of the data in the MARC record is string-based and not designed for direct comprehension by a computer. Also, because the standard is only used within the library community, it has isolated library data from the rest of the world. In addition to not working well on the web, MARC has also not kept pace with changes in cataloging standards. MARC is a flat file format, um, and the new cataloging standards, such as RDA, are multi-relational. With serials, we have horizontal relationships, such as tracing the history of a journal through its various title changes, and we also have vertical relationships. That is the relationships between the journal and its component articles. Neither of these types of relationships are adequately represented within the MARC format. The static and inflexible nature of the MARC record is another limitation. Serials, as we all know, are very fluid in nature, but the record structure we use basically freezes them in time. There's nothing dynamic about MARC records, and in an era where we want to create better context for our users, we find that many of the enhancements that we want to um, give them have no place within MARC records. And perhaps nowhere are the constraints and limitations of the MARC format more apparent than in discussions surrounding Ferber. As I just mentioned, uh, the real weak spot with MARC is in defining relationships between the data. 
And as we all know, Ferber is primarily focused on identifying the relationships between uh, bibliographic resources and the metadata to help people discover those resources. Now we've been talking about Ferber for well over a decade and it has had a significant impact on the way librarians view the bibliographic universe. Uh, what the Ferber conceptual model has done for us is that it has shifted our thinking away from the record as a whole and to the component pieces of data. And because Ferber is an entity relationship model, it forces us to think about how all those components are related to one another. Ferber has also helped us to adjust our thinking by separating the intellectual components of a bibliographic resource from the physical. And by doing this, we're now in a position to better organize our data and provide pathways to enrich our users' experience in finding information. Now throughout the discussions related to serials and Ferber, there's a common theme that crops up. And that is that although Ferber may work well for monographs, it provides a significant challenge for continuing resources. And in much of the experimentation with Ferber, continuing resources have been absent because they are so problematic. Now one reason why serials are not usually seen as convenient for illustrating Ferber is that they are aggr aggregate works. Each serial is composed of smaller independent works that are intellectual works in their own right. So this leads to a modeling challenge when applying the Ferber conceptual model. Another question that comes up when discussing Ferber is, you know, what are the boundaries of a work for a serial? The Ferber document notes that, you know, since a work is an abstract concept, the line that separates one work from another is somewhat arbitrary. Describing serials at the expression level is also somewhat problematic. The, the need to di differentiate between expressions rarely arises when, when cataloging serials. They do not usually have many expressions or versions where the essential content is the same, but the mode of expression is different. The main exception I can think of is uh, with translations. Another area in which uh, serials do not fit well within the Ferber model is at the item level. Since serials are ongoing, there is no one item that exemplifies a manifestation. So you can see from these examples that serials are somewhat at odds with almost every level of the Ferber hierarchy. Now, despite these difficulties, some researchers have analyzed Ferber in relation to serials, and as a result, they've proposed some revisions to the model to better accommodate serial publications. In 2007, at the, at the NASIG annual conference, Catherine Adams and Britta Santamoro suggested that the work and expression levels be combined into what they called the super work expression. And this would be an umbrella record that collects the bibliographic information that relates to the serial's content, and it would also represent such things as translations and different editions. This super record would be like an authority record for the serial publication and would serve all of its manifestations in various formats. To handle the multiple versions issue, the manifestation level would be used to document all the data specific to a particular format. So in this case, there would be a manifestation record for the print, the online, and microfilm records. Now these records would branch off the super expression record, and they wouldn't repeat any information that was contained in the higher level record. And then finally, there would be item records branching off of each manifestation, which would contain local holdings information. Now, Adams and Santamora, they described their modified Ferber model as the best of all possible worlds, in that it combined Ferber thinking with the MARC standard to achieve cataloging efficiencies and the possibility of better user interface design. And when I read this article, I wondered how the author's conclusions might be different if they were writing in today's technological mindset, which appears to be clearly focused on linked data solutions. And my guess is that what they would propose might be, not be that different from the current BibFrame model, which is being developed by the Library of Congress. But I'll get to that in a moment. So what about articles? Aren't they works too? In so many discussions regarding Ferber and serials, the fact that articles are intellectual works in their own right is totally ignored. Now this topic was taken up in 2012 in an article by Laura Cryer, where she takes a fresh look at Ferber 
and applies it to serials in a postmark world, one which is based upon linked data principles. In this article, Cryer acknowledges that the traditional split between the library produced serial records and the metadata produced by indexing and abstracting services is fundamentally unintuitive to users. Uh, current discovery systems do not adequately aggregate article level and journal level metadata, nor do they fully express the relationships between the two. And Cryer makes the point that within the Ferber conceptual model, both the journal and each individual article contained within a journal can be considered a work. And she sees linked data as an opportunity to bring these two work level resources together. So if the relationships are defined between the journal work and the article work, this would enable users to begin their bibliographic searches at either level and seamlessly navigate between the two. Now using Ferber and linked data technology as a way to bridge the journal article divide makes a lot of sense for improving the user experience when they are searching for periodical literature. So I'm just going to stop. I'm just wondering, can everybody hear me now? Um, most of the responses I've been getting online have said, yes, they're hearing things much better. But a, uh, be sure to not to get too close to the microphone. I think it was more uh, the your previous uh, speaker who was had lots of popping and breathing noises. But you're coming through fine right now. OK, I'm just going to try to continue here. OK. OK. Now, for anybody who is accustomed to working with serials, um, you know that you're dealing with materials that are fluid and ever-changing. Now, these types of publications have many interrelationships, and they're increasingly being made available in multiple formats. So in other words, serials are like the shapeshifters of the library world. Now, Ferber holds a lot of promise for better representation of serials to users, but as of yet, it's not been implemented in systems to a great extent. And this is largely because that within a flat record format like MARC, the full range of relationships uh, between resources cannot be adequately represented. But within a linked data environment, which like Ferber is entity relationship based, there is hope for realizing the full potential of Ferber. Now, we've been hearing a lot about linked data within the library community over the past few years. And in these discussions, you probably also uh, heard of the acronym RDF. Now RDF, it stands for Resource Description Framework, and it is the primary data model that's used to publish linked data. Now RDF is not a particular data format like MARC. Instead, it's more of a conceptual framework for representing information about resources on the web. And the idea behind RDF is that you can describe a thing by making statements about its properties. Now, each RDF statement has three components, a, a subject, a predicate, and an object. And this simple structure allows anyone to make simple assertions about anything. So let's say we had a statement um, that we wanted to translate into RDF. So the Journal of Ethology is about animal behavior. So the Journal of Ethology would be the, tr the subject of the triple. The journal is what the statement is about. In between the subject and the object, we have the predicate is about. And this indicates the kind of relationship that exists between the subject and the object. And then finally, we have the object, which is the subject heading animal behavior. And what makes this simple structure especially powerful for information seekers is that the nature of the relationship between the subject and the object is defined. Now, in order for this information to be truly part of the web, it needs to be in a format that can be understood by software applications. And to do this, um, we would substitute a URI for each part of the RDF triple. So by using URIs as names for things, this allows computers to automatically assign values to each part of the statement. Now, as mentioned in the previous example, these statements um, for these statements to connect to other RDF data on the web, we need to use URIs, uh, preferably those that are based on standard identifiers. Now, what standard identifiers do in a linked data environment is um, essentially act as the glue to connect our data to the greater web of data. 
So now I'd like to just very briefly go over some of the different types of identifiers that could support serials in a linked data environment. So first we have the um, Library of Congress authorities and vocabularies. And although this is not specific to serials, the LC Linked Data Service provides access to the commonly found standards and vocabularies produced by the Library of Congress. They have published a number of vocabularies as linked data, such as the LC subject headings, the LC name authority file, the LC classification schemes, as well as many of their smaller vocabularies. Now, the Library of Congress's linked data service enables both humans and machines to um, programmatically access authority data at the Library of Congress. And by providing access to their standardized URIs, it enables libraries to connect their data to the Library of Congress data values. Now, while LC authorities and vocabularies can be uh, broadly used across all resources, if we're looking at serials specifically, the ISSN has great potential to connect serial data to the wider web. Now, ISSN is, is a bit of a complex beast in that um, ISSNs are media specific, so that the print, microfilm, and electronic versions of a journal will have different ISSNs. However, with the creation of the ISSNL, or the, the linking ISSN, in 2007, this has provided us with a unique identifier for all versions of a journal across different media. So within a linked data environment, the ISSN has a potential to collocate the available formats of a serial and also provide a much better mechanism to show the title change history of a serial. Other identifiers, such as um, the International Standard Name Identifier, or ISNI, and ORCID IDs can also play a significant role in connecting article level um, data to the greater web of data. Although these two schemes were developed for slightly different purposes, both the ISNI and ORCID IDs uniquely identify and disambiguate names of researchers, authors, and contributors of creative works and allow for creating relationships among them. So now I just want to um, shift focus a bit and talk about a few linked data initiatives related to serials that could bring us closer to linking serial data to the wider web of data. So no presentation on library linked data would be complete without a mention of the BibFrame initiative that's being spearheaded by the Library of Congress since 2011. Many of you uh, may be following this work quite closely, but for those who aren't, uh, this initiative, it has been summarized by Elsie's uh, Kevin Ford in one single sentence, and that is that the Bibliographic Framework Initiative, it will reimagine and, and implement a bibliographic environment for a postmark networked world. Now the BibFrame Initiative, it has a tall order to fill. It needs to be content model agnostic, that is, it needs to work with a variety of different content standards. It needs to be able to handle the description and management of all formats. It needs to support all types of library data, such as bibliographic, authority, holdings, and classification data. And the final requirement is that it needs to replace MARC. So all in all, it's, it's quite an ambitious project. So, um, sorry. Now the BibFrame model, it's, um, current, the way it currently stands is that it's made up of four core classes. And as you can see from the diagram, there is um, the work, which is defined as a resource reflecting the conceptual essence of a cataloged item. Second to that is the instance, and that's defined as a resource reflecting a material embodiment of a work. And linked to both the work and the instance are authorities. And these are resources that reflect authority concepts, such as people, places, organizations, subjects, etc. Now the fourth core class is um, annotations, and annotations are essentially additional information about a resource. So for example, um, an annotation might be the library's holding information or book cover images, or it could be a related review uh, abstract or excerpt. So as you can see from the model, it appears to be a simplified, less hierarchical version of Ferber. Rather than having Ferber's four levels, uh, work, expression, manifestation, and item, it has condensed it into two, works and instances. And um, generally, the work entity in the BibFrame model is equivalent to both the Ferber work and expression levels, 
and the instance appears to be equivalent to the Ferber's manifestation level. Now, as for the Ferber item, these appear to be attached to the BibFrame instance entity in the form of an annotation for individual holdings. So rather than being a, a strict interpretation of Ferber, I think we could see it as being more inspired by Ferber. And for serials catalogers, it's probably a good thing since the classic Ferber NIP model really never worked perfectly for serial publications. Now most of the current work in, with BibFrame has been on monographic material and there's also been some experimentation in modeling audiovisual materials. So where do serials fit into this mix? Now the topic of serials was brought up at the Q&A in ALA uh, in Vegas this year, and Kevin Ford answered the question on serials by stating that if relationships have been defined in MARC, these will be carried over to the BibFrame model. That said, he also admitted that there was much more work that needed to be done on serials and continuing resources, and he stated that uh, LC, that they have devised a theoretical approach for handling serials, but they need to test the theories through practical experimentation. Now, BibFrame is not the only game in town in trying to create linked data for um, serials. There's another initiative called uh, Press OO, which is a data model that aims to resolve many of the issues in applying Ferber to serials and continuing resources. Now, Press OO is an extension of an earlier data model called Ferber OO, and it was um, developed by the ISSN International Center, the ISSN Review Group, as well as the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Now, version one of the Press OO model was released in 2014, and it, so it's very new to the scene. And in terms of implementation, the ISSN International Center intends to test the Press OO model in the um, data for the Road Directory of Open Access Scholarly Resources Project. And one of the expected outcomes of this project is to publish road data, road serials data in RDF format for broader consumption. So if we move to a linked data model for describing resources, several of the classic problems that serials catalogers have faced with the MARC record structure can be resolved. Linked data can help bridge the journal article divide that's been so confusing to users. If relationships between serial works and article works were defined as linked data, this would enable discovery systems to provide more integrated and seamless search environments where users can easily navigate between the journals and the articles contained within them. Now, I'm not um, suggesting here that librarians should start suddenly taking up um, cataloging at the article level. That's simply not possible. But if both libraries and publishers could both express our, respect, our respective data as linked data, then there's the potential that these two pools of data can be brought together on the web. Linked data can also potentially resolve many of the issues related to complex publication histories. So for instance, by linking preceding and succeeding titles, um, you'll, users will be easily, more easily able to understand relationships between the different titles. The multiple versions uh, problem, which has sprouted countless MARC records in our local systems, can also be greatly alleviated in a linked data environment. If we use the BibFrame model as a guide, we can envision that all of the different versions of a serial publication would be treated as separate instances of a serial work. And then finally, we have citation linking. If articles are treated as works, and then these works can be linked together by creating relationships that state that one article cites another. We currently have access to services such as the Web of Science and Scopus that offer citation analysis, but in order to use them, you need to go to a separate database. But if these relationships were expressed as linked data, then this type of information could be more easily and simply integrated into our discovery systems. So I'm now going to pass it back to Julia, and she'll revisit our Einstein example as linked data, and also look at some of the new opportunities for serials cataloging in a linked data environment. So going back to our Einstein example, and following his advice of not striving to be a success, but rather to be of value, how can we help the user find, the, find his paper? 
Let's look at what extended search and discovery of the various versions of Einstein's paper can look like for a user in a linked data environment. If the original paper is defined as a journal article, that it has German as its language of publication, 1903 as the year of publication, and it's linked to the citation, you, and, and also linked to the authority for Einstein and sub, uh, subject authority for thermodynamics, then you can extend the relationship and establish the two-way relationship to the English translation. We can also see that the English translation is a chapter in a monographic volume and it has, it has its own citation and in terms of relationships, it's also linked to Princeton University Press. We can further extend, see the extensive relationships between the article and the journal by lighting the path to the various manifestations of the article. And if all of this metadata underlie the search interface, it would be possible for the user to find his or her way from whenever they started their search. Once a user reaches the article or chapter uh, of a monographic item, an on-the-fly display could be generated to situate the work within its historical context. And the graph could be extended to include statements about other language of translations and linking to papers that cited Einstein's work, thus allowing the user to explore how Einstein's ideas evolved over time. So currently in our catalog, the record for the English translation of the collected papers is in a way linked to the original German language edition through the use of authorities, through the use of controlled headings um, or uniform titles, and through the classification by way of translation card numbering. So both versions of the collected papers are adjacent on the shelf, but in our case are located in different libraries. In the current MARC environment, the data points that are not fully integrated due, due to MARC limitations that Marlene discussed. In a linked data environment, however, linking the original paper and the translation of the article at the article level would make it easier to find it and is a logical progression of what we have been doing already, which is linking related information, but at a different level of granularity. And although a fully integrated discovery system that would incorporate a variety of information resources with linked data and represent the relationships between them may seem like a distant reality. There are exciting user interfaces that are based on linked data model, and one notable example was, was developed by the National Library of France, Bibliothèque Nationale de France. You can explore it at data.bnf.fr, where you can browse by work, author, and subject which is consistent with Ferber principles. The data on the site uh, focuses on the most prominent authors and works described in the, in the BNF databases, but also includes authors and works about which the BNF uh, provides rare and relevant information. So the platform presents a hub linking a variety of resources, archival and manuscript resources, musical works, in addition to monographs and serials. For many authors, the platform pulls together information from various sources to create context through author entries that include biographical information. And this is similar to the Google Graph results that you might see on the right-hand side if you Google Al Albert Einstein. You can discover Al Einstein's major work and see the relationships between his works by field of activity as the author, editor, conference organizer, and I was particularly excited to see um, a seminal article he wrote on electrodynamics in the Annal in Physics of the same journal we talked about, which is featured among and in the context of his major works. Now, I should note that the platform has the journal level metadata and not the article metadata, uh, article level metadata, and the article that I found, and you can see here, is there because it's an archival resource. Still, um, this kind of discovery environment provides a much richer experience for the user. It opens up the possibility of serendipity, enabling users to come across resources they might never ha have thought existed, such as Einstein's correspondence and even recording of, of his talks. 
user can expand the search by linking to digital libraries that have partnerships with BNF, such as Europeana, OCLC, and SUDOC, which is a catalog for all research libraries in France. The site has an open license, which allows anyone to continue building and linking out to relevant information on the web. And assessment has shown an improved uh, ranking of BNF pages in Google, which, show, which uh, facilitates making unique collections more visible and findable to our users. Now, back in 2001, Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the World Wide Web, wrote that the semantic web will likely profoundly change the very nature of how scientific knowledge is produced and shared in ways that we could now barely imagine. So what are publishers doing on this front? They very much have search and discovery on their mind, but they also focus on using semantic technologies to add value to their discovery services. Here we have the pencil journals where a platform allows you to find and explore plant names by linking out to a different database so you can see and discover where a particular plant in a, uh, grows in the world. And this saves the reader a great amount of time and effort by gathering the relevant information in one place. And the publication of journal articles with linked data enhancements such as, such as this, um, enhancements of basic PDF articles, has come to be known as semantic publishing. In addition to uh, semantic enhancements at both journal and article level, their uh, publishers are using linked data to link semantically related articles. They're also enriching content by adding metadata and seamlessly linking to supplementary materials, such as interactive maps, 3D models, images that provide context, and also increase um, meaning and understanding of the publication. They're integrating citation analysis into display, so you can link directly to the cited by articles. Another uh, way to add value is by linking to multimedia content, such as video abstracts created by authors. And while a recent report found out that open access of scholarly publications is increasing with more than 50% of papers now available for free, publishers are focusing not only on providing content, but adding value through content suggestions, personalized features such as recommendations, through platforms um, such as Mendeley, which became part of Elsevier last year. But what about the data that led to the research results and conclusions published, published in articles? Research data is a vital part of scientific discovery and easy access to research data is, is becoming increasingly important. Some content providers are turning to linked data to create data management infrastructure in order to publish data sets as citable items with unique identifiers. As you see in, in this example of data paper from Zuki's journal, uh, where you see a citation to the article and a separate citation to the data upon which the article is based. Publishers are also making their content more interactive by incorporating videos that highlight authors' research findings, as we see in this example from Cybers. And even though these kinds of enhancements are available on the journal's native interface, it is difficult to find them when you search for an article through an indexing and abstracting database. Now, wouldn't it be also great if this kind of value-added features were integrated with discovery layers? So users would be able to search and display articles in addition to, as well as images and multimedia that are linked to them and the resources that we wouldn't usually catalog. Now, uh, as Marlene um, alluded, many publishers are opening up access to their bibliographic data by publishing it in linked data formats in RDF. For instance, Nature Publishing Group published the bibliographic records of all their journal articles dating back to 1869 as open link data under Creative Commons license. And as more and more data sets are published on the web in machine-readable formats, 
Discover services can take advantage of them and link them automatically with similar data from other sources. So I've shown you a couple of examples of what publishers are doing, but what about libraries? Linked data is also creating new opportunities, but also creating new challenges for libraries. The challenges include copyright issues at data levels, such as data rights and licenses, as many linked data sets are not from, the, from public institutions. But there are also great opportunities opening up. We can now link researchers to their research by creating researcher profiles and creating discipline-based com communities at a local level using tools that have linked data points, such as Vivo, and also linking to ORCID and ISNI profiles. Libraries are more and more focusing on compatibility with the whole bibliographic universe, not just the catalog. And linked data offers opportunity to collaborate with content creators, vendors, web developers, and standards organizations to explore the full potential of enriched online content in order to make the discovery truly boundless. Linked data holds promise to improve information services by collaborating to create interfaces that facilitate discovery of our collections, we can enable social connections, discussion of ideas, and serendipitous discovery within our collection. We can create a completely integrated experience by linking works to concepts, to people and places, and guide users to resources by making the pathway to our resources known. And finally, the creation of authorities has been part of libraries work over a long part of time, long span of time, and it, it is often cited as one of the key strengths of cataloging and bibliographic control. And as catalogers, we have developed an expertise by collectively building authority records associated with bibliographic resources. Authorities are often noted to be the first step on the road to link data for libraries. Now, uh, can we capitalize on this expertise while continuing and expanding in uh, authority creation while also adopting more flexible and web-based technologies. So just to illustrate you how this would help, going back to my Einstein example, when I use someone to find the journal language article, I typed Albert Einstein in the type title of the paper and got zero results. I was a bit puzzled by this because I knew that we had a subscription to Wiley but after several tries, it became apparent that the article wasn't coming up because the name was indexed as A. Einstein, and Albert just wasn't matching any text strings. And if, our, if the Library of Congress authority was linked to the article, it wouldn't matter if this user searched for Albert Einstein or Einstein A or used a different script. In their search, the article would still come up. So the recent developments in, in academic journal publisher, publishing with linked data and semantic technologies can add multiple dimensions to scholarly communication on the web in ways we couldn't have imagined just a decade ago. Here are some of the possibilities for journal literature. The peer-reviewed article can be linked not only to, to journal and databases, but also to the research data that is based among, upon in a located in disciplinary re repository. You might also be interested in exploring the grant application that it's linked to, as well as the preprint in the institutional repository. If you're interested in what other scholars thought about the work, you can read their comments, making peer review process more open. In addition, you can explore supplementary materials works cited, and multimedia linked to the articles. You can also see the article in the contents of the author's works, and if the research was presented at a conference, view the webcast to learn more. The, the view of what a search for literature, uh, serial literature might look like was inspired by Regina Romano Reynolds' presentation at this year's ALA annual conference. And it was at last ALA Midwinter Conference that Eric Miller of the FARA, LCSB Frame Development Partner, noted that we are moving from cataloging to catalinking. With new standards developments and RDA implementation, 
technological innovation that BigFrame can bring us, and a cooperative disposition between libraries, researchers, and content providers, it is definitely an exciting time to be involved with serials and allows us to think about cataloging in new and creative ways. We can extend the library catalog into the realm of the, world, of the web through the creation of links. By, by adding greater contextualization to serial resources through links to authorities and value-added content, we are, in essence, shepherding our users to greater discovery possibilities. So in this presentation, Marlene and I provided an updated presentation on our linked data in, in serials presentation from last year's uh, NACI conference, and we expanded and included a presentation of recent developments in the field. Marlene discussed some of the problems related to serial cataloging that can potentially be solved using linked data and Ferber principles, while adopting a more holistic view of what constitutes work in serial world. She talks, she talks about identifiers and exciting new initiatives related to serials. And in my part, I showed how we can utilize the power of linked data to make the connections between resources, concepts, and creators to create a richer, integrated, and truly boundless discovery experience for our users. We would value any feedback you may have and would be happy to take your questions and comments. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Julia and Marlene. Uh, so far, uh, every question that's been in the Q&A has been about the audio difficulties, um, except for one person wanting to know if you would be willing to have a copy of the slides made available uh, uh, yes. to, to people. Certainly, we could do that. All right. And we will coordinate with you on the best way to uh, make that available to people who are registered. Um, if you have any questions for Julia and Marlene over the presentation, please uh, type them in now. We still have a few more minutes. Um, but while we're waiting for that, I'll go ahead and start doing a little bit of our wrap up. Again, thank you all very much for attending today. Um, after you log out, you'll be directed to a survey, and please fill that out and uh, let us know uh, your thoughts on today's presentation. Oh, here we have a question. Uh, what linked data projects are you engaged in at Toronto? Well, actually, um, can you hear me? I'm on the phone now. Uh, you're very, very uh, okay. I'm soft. Switch over. Um, at the University of Toronto, we're still in the formative stages of um, trying to figure out our, our pathway to linked data. We are. Um, looking a lot at uh, schema.org and seeing how we can apply that to our catalog. And we're also trying to identify um, projects that would be good candidates for linked data. Okay, uh, we have another question. You mentioned citation analysis in an earlier slide. Where does that info come from? Um, so I'm trying to, uh, citation analysis. We were just mentioning like a hypothetical of what could be done if um, articles were connected using linked data so that you could um, so that you could link then from citation to citation. Um, that data didn't come from anywhere specifically. It was just some thoughts that we had on how this data could be connected. Okay. And uh, next question, what can an individual library do with linked data? How to start? Well, that's a great question. I think that um, to start, I think it would be good to just survey what is happening out there before you can actually um, initiate linked data projects, I believe that you really need to do investigation. And I read one thing that I thought was interesting, and these, they're saying that basically if you, the first thing you should do is try to consume linked data and see what you can do with it, and that will lead you to um, sort of figure out your pathway and how you want to ex expose it and what you want to do with it. Okay, and 
Uh, this will probably be our final question. How well do you see bib frame handling change over time in serial data? Learn, you can learn more about the, the bib frame vocabularies that are now published on the bib frame website. In terms of how how we can how they how bib frame can handle change over time, I guess it remains to be seen as. Uh, it, the uh, big frame hasn't been fully flushed out and implemented, but we hope that it would be able to handle both horizontal relationships and changes in titles over time, as well as vertical relationships between articles and journals. All right, and that seems to be all the questions that we have, and all the time that we have. So again, I'd like to thank Julia Marlene for the presentation today. I'd like to thank all of you for registering and attending. We will be sending out a recording of this presentation uh, within a few days. So those of you who did experience some audio issues off and on, you should be able to listen to the full presentation. If there are problems with the recording, please let us know. Uh, and with that, I will bid you all a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much.